But I have a word this morning that's a little different um, from some of the things that I, I normally teach by story. This morning, I really feel a need to preach through the scripture. And so I'm going to make you a deal. I have not given you sermon notes, but if you want my notes, you're welcome to, to let me know and I'll send those to you, okay? <coughs> There's a lot of scripture that I'm going to read through here today, and every bit of it is important for us to hear. All right, Kevin Gentry is working on a new website for St. Mark's. Please say thank you to him. Thank you. Yes. He was gracious to let me see it last week. He probably won't make that mistake again. Um, but one of the things, <laughs> I love you. Um, one of the things that he has on there is this little red button, and it has a white arrow in it, and I didn't know what it was, so I pushed it, and it took me to YouTube. Any of you have been on YouTube? There's all kinds of great stuff on there and some not-so-great stuff on there. But did you know that all the sermons from St. Mark's since October the 13th, 2013, are on a YouTube channel? So you can go back and you can see those. Um, I didn't know that. I honestly thought we just put the last four on our website, but they're actually all on YouTube, and they're on Facebook. I'm glad I clicked on there, though. Um, it was helpful to look back and see what I had preached about this particular topic, Does God Have a Will for My Life? Now, if you were here last July when I first came to St. Mark's, you know that I firmly believe that God does have a will for my life and yours, oh, by the way. Um, I told you some of the story associated with my calling into ministry, how the Lord directed the circumstances and the struggles and the questions, the surprising moments when I knew that God had indeed spoken. I looked it up yesterday on YouTube. It was July the 15th of last year. At the conclusion of that sermon, some of you came forward sensing that God was calling you. Some knew what God was calling you to do. Others said, I don't know what it was, but I, I know that God has beckoned. I mean, I'm thinking back over the year and, and, and recognizing that some of you have actually stepped into some of those callings, like Ashley teaching our, our middle school. You had no idea that one was going to happen, did you? No, but you knew God had called, right? Yeah. Um, Mary Neal, you know that God is calling our youth forward, and, and all of a sudden, some things have started to pull together. Who would have seen that coming? Not any of us, I don't think. And yet, you knew that God had called you. Um, all kinds of new things, and Marty, by the way, welcome home. Um, others of you perhaps sensed a call that day, but nothing else has happened to make that calling clear. It's like God beckoned, you said yes, and then there was kind of this void. And that can leave us with some real questions, can't it? Mm -hmm. um, does God really have plans? Was it just emotions or feelings that caused me to respond? Or bad pizza, as one of my worship instructors used to say. <laughs> um, perhaps you weren't here last year at all, and that's okay. I'm glad you're here today. But this question of what is God's will for me is so common and so important that literally millions of books have been written about it, 668 million, if you go to Google. So that question is prevalent in our culture, whether it's a, a sermon that's prompted the question, and I hope it does, um, or thinking about a big decision that needs to be made or um, a life circumstance that maybe causes you to wonder or a vague sense of unhappiness or unease or maybe it's one of those unplanned transitions in life or even a, a planned one that you knew was coming. This is one of those questions that we really need an answer to, don't we? Yeah, everybody wants to, to ask that question at some point in their lives. While it's comforting to hear somebody else's story, and we do need to hear them because they're a great source of encouragement, what our hearts really long for is to know that God has written a story for us, isn't it? Yes. That's what we want to know. Well, what I'm hoping to do in this series, and we're going to run all the way through September, is to help you find scriptural answers to the question, does God have a will for my life? Marty's going to talk next week about God, how God's been pestering him with this word discernment. The following week, we're going to address the question that many skeptics have. Well, isn't life just a matter of circumstances and the decisions that we make? And lastly, we're going to look at how we can discern that will of God individually. That's where we're headed. Does it sound like a plan? Okay. First, where does this notion of God having plans come from? 
Well, it comes right out of Scripture. Almost every book of the Bible contains at least a few passages about God's plans. For example, I try to read through the Scriptures at least once a year. My reading right now is in the prophet of Jeremiah. Don't read that before you go to bed. Um, <laughs> Jeremiah 31, 31 says, The days are coming when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, declared the Lord. Sounds like God has plans, doesn't it? Jeremiah 31, 38, the days are coming when this city will be rebuilt. Sounds like God had plans, doesn't it? Yeah. Jeremiah 32, 14 through 15, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Jeremiah, take those documents and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. What does it sound like to you? God has plans. Jeremiah 32, 28, this is not a nice one. I'm about to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who will capture it. What does it sound like? God has plans. And these are just two chapters of Jeremiah. Two chapters, and there's much more in that book that I could have referenced. Anytime we read a prophet, we need to stop and ask, did those things come true? Those of you who just studied Ezra and Nehemiah, did those things come about? Yeah, we just read about all of those things in that study. Every single one of those things came to pass. Yes, so God spoke through his prophet, and we can go back historically and know that those happened. And many other places in Scripture affirm that God has plans as well. Did you know that Israel's entire history that would be, will be, all of those who will, would eventually rule over Israel are outlined in the second half of Daniel? Did you know that? You can go back and you can find that record, and they happened. They came to pass. And then there's Isaiah and Habakkuk and Joel. One of the clearest is in Psalm 33:10. This is the Lord foils the plans of the nations; He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of His heart through all generations. That says to me that God's is at heart a planner. And as I look back at all those scriptures, it looks very much like he wants us to know those plans and to be able to count on them, doesn't he? Yes. Okay, listen to these words from Isaiah, Isaiah 46, 10. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. Isaiah 48, 5 through 6. Way back then, these are God's words, I told you what would happen so you wouldn't claim some other God was responsible. Some figurine you crafted from wood and molded metal commanded it and accomplished it. You've heard what I foretold. Now you've seen what happened. Do you agree that I'm God? Right out of the book of Isaiah. Have you ever wondered why we're not supposed to seek fortune tellers or palm readers or tarot cards or any of those things? It's because the Lord has written our plans over us. So when we seek some else, something else, we're seeking something other than God and making an idol of it. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Okay. All right, now having heard those passages, would you agree that God is a planner? Yes. That he wants us to know his plans? That his plans will come to pass? Yes. That, he, that he tells us those things because he wants us to recognize that he is God? Yes. And you're getting weaker. Do you believe those things? Yes. Okay, that's what the scripture says. All, right, all of those passages that we read a moment ago could have been written for individuals or they could have been written for nations. Even the passage that I spoke of with the kids this morning, that one that so many know and love, Jeremiah 29, 11, for you know this, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a Future. That's a promise that's actually written to the nation of Israel. A good question to ask then, is there anything in Scripture that points directly to the plans of God for an individual? Well, in Jeremiah 1.5, these are God's words to Jeremiah. Listen to this. Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Does it sound like God had plans for his life? Okay, but Jeremiah was a prophet. What about us normal people? <laughs> well, there's some beautiful psalms that address that very question. Psalm 25 that we read portions of this morning in verse 12 says, Who then is the man that fears the Lord? Listen to this. He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. 
Or Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye upon you, or the favorite of many, Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And those beautiful words. All right, now you need to know some of these things. Some scholars say, well, those are just the Psalms. Those are people's feelings and emotions. They're songs about their relationship with God. They help us understand God better, but they don't necessarily teach truth. Now, I don't believe that, okay? And some, but some of you may, especially since some of those psalms are clearly prophetic. And, but you should know that some scholars do just think those are words written about our relationship with God, that they're not true. Um, some scholars also believe that um, God simply has a general will that is, his will for me is the same as it is for you and you and you and you and you and you and you. What do you think? Good question, isn't it? All right, some of the things that they point to when they say that, um, because there's lots of verses and passages about God's will for us, um, is that, well, no, God means the same thing for everybody. He purposes good for everybody. Well, that's true. Um, whole, mo whole movements have sprung up, for example, from Old Testament words like Micah 6, 8. The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Comes right out of a great song. Is that an easy thing to follow? No. Do you know what it means? Sometimes. It can mean whatever, about whatever you want it to mean. If you look at it real closely, it means sort of loosely that we ought to follow God. And you can define that in a lot of ways, can't you? That's why a lot of people really like that passage, because there's no clear definition in it. Okay? But in the New Testament, the times that we live in, the general will of God gets much more specific. Listen, 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God wants everybody to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Those two things are interchangeable. Okay, he wants everybody to be saved, but this is, this is what needs to happen. We need to come to that knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3.9 says he doesn't want anybody to perish, and so he desires for all of us to come to repentance. Acts 17 tells us why. Because one day, the world is going to be judged, and he doesn't want anybody to be on the wrong side of that judgment. So he tells us what is good for us, his general will, and he's always pointed that way out, what is good, this is the way walk in, and he's still doing it, isn't he? Yes. All right. Amen. And then there's some priorities for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, says to make it a priority to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and that when we do that, everything else that we need is going to be added to us. Why do you suppose that is? Could it be that in seeking him as a priority, we're going to find out everything else that's important, including perhaps the order for our lives? 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, so we're to become disciples, learning as much as possible about him growing more and more like him. Now, those are general will things. They're for everybody, aren't they? They're for everybody, aren't they? I knew you knew that. Okay. Um, some of God's general will is really explicit. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, for example, says, It is God's will, and those are the words, It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that's holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Now, I'll leave you to figure out what that means, but you can say amen or you can say ouch. And then there are those things that every single believer is to do. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make of all, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to do everything I have taught you. 2 Corinthians 5.20. So we are Christ's ambassadors, God making his appeal to us. So we speak for Christ when we plead to those who don't know him, come to Jesus Christ. It's God's general will. They're for everybody to carry out their incredible purposes, aren't they? Well, are there scriptures that point to this idea of God's having an individual plan for each of us? 
1 Peter 4.10 says each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. And so it addresses individual gifts. That's still pretty general, isn't it? Yeah. Romans 12, 1 through 2, listen carefully to this, says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And as I listen to that passage, it too could be general, but it indicates in it that some of those questions that we face individually, we might not find answers for in the scriptures. Not clear ones anyway. And we certainly aren't going to find them in the culture, are we? No. no. But that God does have a will about a particular matter. And it's up to us discern, to discern that. He wants us to do that. Did you hear that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to that passage in a couple of weeks and talk a little bit more about it because it gives us a couple of very clear directives if we want to know the will of God. Those who believe that God has only a general will for people usually have a very transcendent view of God. That is, he is high and mighty and wholly other. And their criticism of people who believe that God has an individual plan is that we have too intimate a view of God. Listen to these passages. Psalm 37, 4 says, Take delight in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That means he knows them, doesn't it? <laughs> Luke 12, 7 says he knows the number of hairs on your head. It sounds pretty intimate, doesn't it? Philippians 1, 6 says he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until Jesus Christ returns. That work that he started in you, that's something that he started. It doesn't sound like a distant God, does it? No. It sounds like a God who knows you and has intentionally started a good work in you. You know, as I look into Scripture, that's the God that I find. One who has great big plans, plans that are going to span generations, plans that nothing is going to stop. They're plans for ultimate good for everyone who will follow. They're plans that he wants us to know and trust so that we'll follow them because he wants the best for us. But I also find that intimate God who, has, who knows me, who started a good work in me that only he can bring me um, that only he can bring to completion. Well, what is that work? Some of it is going to be internal, because you know that God's got to do a work in us before we're going to be of a whole lot of use to others, before we're that box <laughs> that he can pour his purposes into. Um, we're going to explore that idea over the next couple of weeks. I believe it also has to do with the purposes and plans though, that he has for each individual's life. This passage from Ephesians 2.10 is one of those reasons. It says, God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God has made us to do good works, which God planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. It sounds pretty specific, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If that interpretation is correct, then like the test for the prophets, we should see that carried out in the scripture and in lives of people that we can read about there. This is how good God is. As I was preparing um, study materials for this 20-day challenge and reading and responding to a chapter a day, I felt clear direction to go study the Gospel of John. The only problem is there's 21 chapters of John, and it's just a 20-day challenge. And I said, well, God, what do I do with this 21st chapter? And he said, well, read it. I want you to use it as an example for this study. And so I did. And, and you know what I found as I read it? <laughs> That example that I was looking for for today, and this morning, as I was reading. In John 21, Jesus brings restoration to Peter after he's denied him just before his crucifixion. You remember that story? And he's inviting him back into relationship, asking him once again to follow. As he does, he warns him what's to come. Listen. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would die, but with the assurance that his death would bring glory to God. Does that sound individual to you? Typical of Peter, then he then points to John and says, well, what about him? 
And Jesus' response is, well, if I want him to remain until I return, what is it to you? You follow me. Does it sound like he has a plan for John's life too? Okay. You must follow me. So there was a plan for Peter's life. There was a plan for John's life. Now, having heard all these scriptures and looking how they fit together, do you think there's a plan for your life? I hope so. <laughs> like I said, if you want those notes, I'd be glad to share them with you. And there are ways that we can actively discern the will of God. One of the most important is that we are reading systematically through the Word of God. That's what this 20-day challenge is all about. Okay, it asks you to read a chapter a day in the Word of God. It asks you to look for what you see there, or what are those general observations, things that jump out and say, yeah, pay attention to this. And then it asks you to pinpoint one of those that God is kind of highlighting, that he's speaking just to you about. And then to write how that applies to your life. As you go through that, you know, so often as we're reading through the scriptures, he answers the questions of our hearts. He points out ways to move. Maybe he'll point out some plans for our lives. So if you want to take part in that, and I hope that you will, they're all strewn across the back of that bench back there in the narthex. There are those study guides. Now, if you can come on Tuesdays, starting September the 17th, we're going to look at those observations and applications together, both at 1 o'clock and at 7. If you can't be there, I'd love to hear from you online. Because I want to hear what God is doing in your life and what he speaks to you about the plans that he has for you. Because you know when we're called together as a body, if that plan includes you, most likely it includes us too, doesn't it? Will you do that? All right. I can't wait to see what he does as he molds and shapes us together. We're going to close this particular time singing just two verses of Have Thine Own Way, Lord. As we sing it this morning, I'll invite you to respond as your heart prompts you to do. Ask the Lord if you are to take this study. Um, My hope is yes, Um, but you ask him this morning. See if there's something else he might whisper to you. Andrew Rears.